the question. Okay, so thanks a lot, Joel. Uh, thank you very much again. So uh, our next speaker is Tian. Can people hear me? Good. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so our next speaker is Tian Xie from Microsoft Research, AI for Science. So he'll talk to us also about materials, but using AI instead of using quantum computers. <laughs> so Tian, please. Thank you very much. Uh, can people hear me well from the mic? Okay, good. Very exciting. So very excited to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. So uh, I'm, I think it's a very good connection from the last talk. Today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, rethinking material discovery with generative models. Uh, I'm, I'm from Microsoft Research AI for Science. So this is a new part of an uh, uh, institution that is established inside Microsoft Research, uh, where we're focusing on using AI to solve scientific questions. So, uh, so it's very great to be here to be physically because I, I really missed this kind of in-person talks. Uh, I have been giving many virtual talks many times, so I really enjoy this. So let's try to make this more interactive. So feel free to interrupt me at any time because I know the audience is from many different backgrounds. So, so if you have a question, please feel to just jump in anytime. So at this around the time, uh, I would always start like to start my talk with the, the COP conferences. This is the United Nations Climate Change Conference that was heard annually around the world. So the last one, COP26, is heard in the UK in Glasgow. Uh, and uh, this is trying to coordinate the effort around the world to solve the biggest crisis that we're facing today, climate change. So one of the key problems that we're trying to resolve in climate change is really to keep the global warming within 1.5 degrees. And this is an extremely challenging task because we're now already at around 1.2, 1.3 degrees. So, so you can see, so this is the diagram that people have proposed, uh, that people have proposed that this is the level of carbon reduction in terms of CO2 emission that we need to achieve in the next, uh, say, uh, 20 to 30 years if we want to achieve zero carbon, uh, 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 if we want to limit uh, the global uh, temperature increase within 1.5 degrees. So in a lot of these different uh, projections, there are usually two phases. The first phase is the rapid reduction of CO2 into zero. And what it means is that it requires a lot of information beyond electric cost, which is considered already kind of a solved problem. We need, uh, for example, if we want to have a uh, big solar cells and wind farms within electric grid, we need to grid level energy storage. So uh, for the production of fertilizer also created a lot of CO2, which is an unsolved problem today as well. We need to reduce the CO2 that it emitted during the production of steel and many, many other problems. And there is a second phase here, as you can see, that uh, we need to have a negative carbon em emissions. What it means is that we need to suck CO2 out of atmosphere uh, using by some materials uh, so that this is the only way because we're already emitting too much CO2. It is very hard to imagine that we could achieve uh, the 1.5 degree increase without any car uh, carbon capture uh, at industrial scale. Uh, so these are all very grand challenges that we need to solve in a very short period of time within maybe 10, 20 to 30 years. And the current way of a way, uh, and uh, as I'm gonna see you in the next slide, uh, as, uh, material discovery really plays a central role here. As you can see, uh, in order to have the energy storage, we need to have better batteries. In order to produce this fertilizer, electrical field, we need to have a catalysis. In order to capture CO2 from the atmosphere, we need to have materials that can capture gas from the atmosphere. And this all comes back to this material discovery problem that we hope to tackle. And this is a notoriously slow process. Traditionally, for example, today's battery we're using are developed originally in, uh, in 1970s. Uh, it takes around 20 to 30 years for these materials to be developed and commercialized. So if we really want to solve climate change in the next 20, 30 years, 
we need to really rethink the way that we do material discovery. And uh, we, think that, uh, we think that the huge amount of competition that is available in the past decade would really allow us to accelerate that, and the machine learning would certainly play an important role here. So now, hope that uh, this introduction gives you some motivation why material discovery is an important problem. So that, now let's try to define what this problem actually is. So in material discovery, we're interested in finding materials given a set of property constraints. Uh, so for example, in the battery case, one of the found material can conduct the lithium ion very well. It needs to be thermodynamic stable, uh, and uh, it needs to have certain uh, band gap, uh, which uh, certainly I'm not going into details. So once you find such a material computationally, which is usually defined by an atomic structure in here, you would go to the, the lab and try to think this as a material and then measure its property, and you would hope that the eventual material you find at the end will have as good as property uh, you would have predicted computationally. And uh, yeah, to make this prediction better, we probably need a better quantum computers, but uh, there's all, a lot of ways we can simulate them using classic computers. Uh, so, and the current way people are doing this is this idea of screening, which you start with a large set of candidates uh, uh, of unknown materials, uh, see, uh, of, of exist, sorry, existing known materials. There's around 100,000 of them. And you will run a bunch of calculators, com compute a range of its properties, and gradually filter down the candidates. And then the best candidates, uh, the one that, that is, for example, in here, will then be sent into the lab and go for a synthesis. So basically, you basically run t tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of calculations to screen these materials. And from this, you'll find the best one and send that to, to the lab to synthesize. And this is, this, is a call, this is a field called high throughput material discovery. Uh, it has uh, really kind of, a, in a way, revolutionized the field of material discovery in the past decade because we are having access to these big computers that you can run tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of calculations in parallel. So you can do this in a reasonable speed so that it has resulted in some experimental discovery of materials uh, and some of them even begin to become commercialized. So this is the current paradigm of high thermal material discovery, but I would argue that it has a major limitation uh, because it always needs to start with a fixed set of candidates. It means that it is just uh, trying to repurpose the set of known materials into new applications. So in fact, there are only around 100,000 materials that we have already known today that was collected, experimentally verified. And uh, a lot of this effort has been done in the past decade is just really trying to repurpose these new materials for different sub-applications by doing a lot of calculations uh, of their properties. So what we're super excited is that uh, what if we can pursue a different paradigm? If we can explore the set of unknown materials whose structure has never been discovered before, uh, and can we discover better materials from those? So what are the reasons why we want to explore unknown materials? with uh, maybe already 100K materials that we already know. The first reason, obvious, obviously, is that there is a much bigger space out there of unknown materials compared with known materials. So this is the estimation that uh, it's, it's very, very like a restrictive estimation, just assuming that you're only having materials made up of four, up to four elements, but you already have 10 to the order of 10 uh, quaternary materials which is, I think, at least the five to, to, to six order of the magnitude to the bigger than the space that we're looking at right now. Uh, and that, another thing that is even more important is that many key applications often require some materials with contradicting properties uh, with, that, are, that are rare or even non-existent in the real world. So I give you one example, but this is a class material called the thermoelectric materials that would require a material to have a good, uh, good electric conductivity but a low thermal conductivity. So if we can find a such a material, you can basically replace your air conditioner with a solid state chip, which is much smaller and much more energy efficient. But we have not, so, but with the research in like maybe 30, so more than 30 years, uh, we, have, uh, we have only made uh, this progress. We need to get this number to four, but uh, now it's only around the three, the best material that we have so far. One of the major reasons is that you need to have this contradicting property in this set of materials. 
so, so, so I have mentioned that this is exciting to explore unknown materials. I would also mention this is a very, very challenging problem. Uh, so there are existing ways one could solve this. So there is the, uh, this, uh, this ARIS, uh, Ab Initio Random Structure Search Approach. This is actually uh, developed uh, by a professor at the University of Cambridge, uh, Chris Pika. I'm sure some of you may be heard of the, him. But uh, basically, this, this is the big direction. The idea is to use, uh, to generate a lot of random structures and use quantum simulator to simulate which one is uh, stable. But uh, it is exhaustive search. Search has been used to discover many unknown materials. But as you can see, it's highly, highly inefficient. So usually you need to compute maybe half a million structures in order to maybe find 10 to 20 structures. Uh, as you can see, you can never scale that into, into say, finding tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of materials. So the second approach people have tried is the idea of substitution. So basically, you're taking existing known materials and you substitute the atoms in it, hoping to create a new material using the template of existing materials. This is actually the approach being used in some of the biggest uh, material databases, like Materials Project, etc. And people have been trying to scale that into an entire PR table. Uh, so, this, so, so let's first maybe talk a little bit how far we can go with substitution idea. So this is the work that is done by one of our colleagues, uh, Chi Chen, uh, before he joined Microsoft. Uh, so the idea here is that you're taking all the existing known materials, uh, a, a lot of existing known materials, sorry, 5,000 five, five materials as templates, and you do substitution. And from which you get 32 million candidates, uh, which is maybe around 200 times bigger than one of the biggest uh, pro uh, uh, open databases out there. And uh, so you would like to certainly uh, to, to, to relax all of them to compute whether or not it's stable, but uh, it's, it's extremely expensive. It's, it would have cost uh, like 2.5 uh, billion CPU hours if you wanted to relax all of them because the space is just too big. So the idea in this work is really try to learn a surrogate model. So uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with graph neural networks, and, uh, but basically the idea here is to take the, the energy and the forces of uh, all, the, all the relaxation strategies of all the materials that is available in the older main database across the entire of the table and train a graph neural network, which basically learns a surrogate model to estimate the potential energy surface around the equilibrium structure. Using this, we could basically, uh, basically to, re to use this surrogate model to replace DFT, which is a quantum simulator, which will be around a thousand times faster. And then what they have done is that uh, they have used this surrogate model to screen the 32 million candidates, and around a million of them to, uh, predict to be stable. And this, I think, is one of the biggest data, uh, op, like machine learning predict set of materials out there. And now it's open, uh, open in this the metaverse.ai database. So I'm not going into details, but uh, feel free to ask questions if you're interested more. Uh, but uh, so, so this substitution has been extremely exciting approach to really find unknown materials that we have not know, uh, that uh, beyond the set of materials that we already know. But uh, there are obviously many limitations of substitution. Otherwise, I'm not talk, I'm not going to talk about the generator models, right? So, uh, one of the major limitations of the subs pro uh, substitution is that uh, you're limited to set of an existing known prototype, right? So you cannot really explore new structure templates that is not available in your data set, so it's extremely limited. And the second major limitation I think is even more important is that uh, basically this exploration of unknown material is really unconditional, right? So you're just uh, finding new stable materials, but a much better way would be if you can find new materials guided by the targeted properties that you're interested in. For example, if you're interested in batteries, I may find a I want to generate materials that is uh, having good uh, battery properties, right? So, so this becomes an even bigger problem if you have a larger set of candidates. Let's say that you, you expand the existing set from 100,000 to a million, the, that it will take 10 times more to screen all of these candidates. So, so therefore, it becomes increasingly important if you have a bigger set of unknown materials, it's becoming increasingly hard to use screening-based approach to, to, to find good materials. So this is the kind of a hopeful motivates, right? Why we are interested, we hope, we think that the generating model for materials is a way to resolve all these problems. 
So uh, I'm, I'm not sure like, how familiar this audience is with Genesis models. I have some pretty introductory stats here. So, so I guess many of you have heard about uh, the generative model for images, right? So the idea is that you learn those images that are real images from the internet, which basically defines an empirical image of P of X, where this X is the image. Uh, so you learn a generative model for in which you basically learn from this empirical distribution, you learn a parameterized distribution of this image such that you can sample new images from this distribution. So therefore, given this, uh, so by learning from uh, this distribution of images, you will sample new images that are not in the internet, but look photorealistic. And there has been a significant progress in the past uh, five years in making this really, really good. Uh, and uh, so the idea is of conditional generation is that uh, you can even condition on see some text description of images, so you can directly generate images that are following such a text, right? So, so here the, the Y is a, is a text. So there is a reason to, uh, many people in the AI field consider it as a huge breakthrough, uh, developing open, open AI. So if you have never heard about it, please test it out on this website. You, it will be able to, so people have just shown in past, dec, past, the fa, uh, past half a year, that you can just give a text description to directly generate images uh, based on this text description that looks really, really good, which was used to be considered impossible, but uh, it was just achieved in the, pa in the past half a year, uh, created a lot of excitement in the AI community. So what we were trying to do here is basically to have a generative model for materials, where we learn from the distribution of all the stable materials from the training data and uh, to learn a generative model for materials. And by sampling from this uh, parameterized distribution, we basically can find a lot of new materials unconditionally. And then in here, we're also interested in conditional generation. We hope to condition on the target properties that we're interested in, for example, battery materials to generate unknown new materials that are stable, that would help us a lot to, to find many new materials that has not been able to discover on today's approaches. Uh, so I'm going to next phase, I'm going to a little bit details about uh, what uh, our algorithm will look like, but uh, uh, maybe for half our understanding, maybe it's good to start with some more mathematical description about what actually materials are. So uh, materials are uh, infinite periodic structures of atoms uh, in the 3D image. So mathematically, they can be described by n atoms in a 3D space plus a periodic lattice. So these n atoms can be defined by their atom types, which is selecting one atom from the periodic table, and their coordinates. And, uh, but the unique thing here is that we have periodicity. So we have three letters here, uh, L1, L2, L3. They don't have to be perpendicular to each other, but uh, they describes the periodicity of the material along the three directions. So therefore, if you do any translation along any integer combination of these three vectors, you will basically be able to tire the entire space by basically translating this so-called unit cell, these n atoms, to kind of tire the entire 3D space to form the 3D structure of material. And the goal uh, of our generative model is basically to generate this 3D object for materials. And then one of the key challenges here is that we really need to consider some of the symmetry of the materials. For example, uh, this is a fundamentally determined by quantum mechanics. But uh, for example, if you try to exchange two atoms of the material, right, material will, the material will not change. If you rotate this material, the material will also not change. Right? So, and also, if you translate this material in the three dimension, the material will also not change. And there's some other invariances more corresponding to the change of a lattice L, basically, which is that uh, for the same material, infinitely large periodic structure, you actually have many different ways of choosing this L1, L2, L3. And so ideally, you would like your generative model to be respecting these kind of symmetrical invariances because that would uh, allow you to, to generate much more realistic materials by building this inductive bias uh, into your machine learning model. Uh, so there has been a lot of work in this space to generating the, the structure for 3D materials, but all past works have a lot of limitations. For example, one people, uh, some people have tried to directly build a generative model just by concatenating all these 
three uh, vectors that I mentioned together into like a long vector to generate these materials. But, uh, and uh, there's another idea to treat uh, the, the 3D structure of a material as a 3D voxel image to generate a voxel image representation of materials. But this problem, but they all lack the symmetrical invariance that I have mentioned earlier. And there has also been work in the space of generating 3D molecules for drug design. But uh, uh, they have the problem that they don't really properly take care of the periodicity problem that I have mentioned earlier. And we have limited, so it cannot work for the entire periodic table because it works for the limited elements for molecules like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, so, so in this work, uh, uh, this is the work that I did before joining Microsoft. Is uh, go ahead, please. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So that is a great question. So the constraint is that the material needs to be stable. I know it's very like uh, abstract, but uh, basically uh, you need to use quantum mechanics. If you verif if you generate the material, you need to use quantum mechanics to verify if it's not stable. But uh, we have a lot of existing data of these stable materials. Yeah. So it's basically like an image, right? So you, you can you can see. If an image is stable, but uh, it's harder to describe whether or not it's stable. Yeah. yeah. OK. Great question. Yeah, feel free to interrupt. So yeah, so basically, this is the work that uh, we did, uh, which is called crystal diffusion variation of the encoder. So this is, uh, I think, this is the first uh, uh, generative model for periodic structures that satisfy all the symmetric invariances that I mentioned earlier. So at a higher level, uh, it is a autoencoder architecture. Uh, so basically, the idea of autoencoder is that uh, you have an encoder and a decoder, and the encoder encodes the, the representation of the structure into a, a fixed length vector in a latent space, and decoder kind of decodes it back into the representation of the material that I mentioned earlier. So the, so the key part here is to make both the encoder and decoder uh, invariant with respect to this symmetric invariance I mentioned earlier. And uh, so uh, I'm not going to talk about the encoder because it's kind of like more like a past work. Uh, but uh, the idea is to use a graph neural network that is a approach to represent uh, this material as a periodic graph uh, that can handle all the symmetric invariance that I mentioned earlier. So, so the encoder part uh, is actually quite a standard now, uh, and uh, so I did a lot of work in that space, but uh, the, this is a quite a standard now. So the key innovation of this work is really the decoder part. So how can you decode from a, a vector into the, a material that represents a periodic structure that, and then satisfy all the symmetric variables? So that is the key innovation of this work. Uh, so before going into details, let me describe uh, this new class of a generative model called uh, a denoising score matching networks, or many people call it diffusion model. So the idea is that uh, basically you, you think of the generation material as a denoising process. For example, if you start out with an image, during the training, you just add a lot of Gaussian noise into that image. And then you basically learn a new network to kind of denoise this image uh, iteratively. So therefore, because at the end, it's become a Gaussian noise, right? So therefore, basically, when you generate, you can just randomly sample from a Gaussian noise and apply the more denoising model to generate the 3D strategy, uh, sorry, to generate the, that image. And this is one of the state-of-the-art model in image generation. So the idea we're having is very similar. We have a periodic structure of a material, where during the training, we add a noise to both the atom coordinates and atom types. And so basically, at the end, you become a noisy kind of a, a, a crystal. And then during the generation, you basically use the model to, to, to denoise from this uh, random structure material into the final structure. So, so let's assume that we already trained the model. So how do we generate the material at the end? So the idea is that you start with a fixed length vector z. From this, you have a, a property predictor, which predicts the three property of the pro material that you want to generate. The first is the composition, which is a property distribution of elements, selecting what element you're interested in this material. And then the lattice is this periodic cell that I mentioned earlier. Finally, is how many atoms you have in the system. 
And uh, so given these three information, you can randomly initialize a 3D structure of a material uh, that is the kind of a somewhat close to the final structure that you're generating by randomly initializing both atom types and positions. So the motivation of this step is that it will make, it much, uh, will make the second step much easier. So the second step is basically we have this graph new network that iterates up, iteratively updates this initial random position of atoms and iterates updates the atom types and the positions uh, using a graph new network uh, through this so-called longitudinal dynamics process such that uh, uh, by doing this much iteratively, you can basically uh, denoise a unstable structure into a stable structure that then we can verify using quantum mechanics. So this is the graph new network that takes in the 3D structure material and outputs two information. One is the for each node, it outputs a gradient for each node that pointing from a, a high energy state to a low energy state. And the second output is a property distribution over each atom which tries to update atom types based on surrounding environments. And this graph neural network architecture that is developed, used here ensures all the symmetrical invariances that I have mentioned earlier. Uh, so uh, let me take how, how long do I have? I have, a, I have 15 minutes. OK, so, uh, so basically this is, the, so this is the more detailed uh, version about uh, how does this generation actually works. So basically, it actually is a so-called a near the longitudinal dynamics process, which actually uh, you kind of add a noise into this generation process. So therefore, we have like 50 different noise levels from, from like a higher level to lower, lower level noise. Uh, each one have 100 steps, so therefore there's like 5,000 steps uh, in order to generate this material in which we update both atom types coordinates gradually uh, using reduced noise. So uh, a little bit details all the edges, the graph is kind of dynamically mid-built while you, you're updating the structure of material and uh, all this incorporates the periodicity of the material such that you can, you can generate a th uh, periodic structures. Uh, so this is an uh, animation of really just showing the process of you starting from an initial random structure and gradually deform it into a pretty realistic uh, material if you are familiar with uh, what a real material lo looks like. <laughs> yeah, but uh, this looks quite good if uh, you are a material scientist. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm talking a little bit about training. So the training of the structure is that uh, basically in, in this network we have three networks. One is the encoder, one is the property predictor, one is the decoder. So these all three networks are kind of trained together by supplying the stable structures that you know as training data, and we have three losses. The first loss is the decoder loss, in which we kind of add a noise into this uh, stable structure, and then you basically letting this network to kind of denoise it by, uh, by updating both atom types and positions. And the second is property prediction loss, uh, in which you try to basically minimize the property prediction of the, of the property predictor that I have mentioned earlier. Finally, is a KI divergence loss, uh, for the other encoder, which function more like as, as a regularizer uh, to uh, preventing you from overfitting the training data. Uh, so, so given this model, we are interested in really evaluating the quality of the material that we generate. So we actually curated a lot of data, three data sets that uh, cover different type of material uh, distributions. One, this data set having a lot of material with similar structure but different properties, uh, sorry, different composition, different uh, uh, elements. And then this one are all carbon, but uh, they have very different structure of carbon. And last one is the, the most important one, which basically takes all the experimental known materials with no more than 20 atoms uh, in the unit cell. So this, the last one is the most important data set. And we have a bunch of baselines uh, that I'm not going into details, but these are kind of the state of art of the base methods that are in the three different classes that I have mentioned earlier. Uh, so the task is to generate uh, 10,000 materials by randomly sampling the latent space just to evaluate the quality of materials that we generate. And we found that uh, we, we, we developed a bunch of metrics including the validity of the material, coverage with respect to the entire material space, and the, the statistics, the materials properties like the density and energy, uh, et cetera. So and in this table, which are also not going into details, we've shown that the model really significantly outperforms past models. 
in, in all these metrics. So especially the coverage, you can see many other models are kind of really close to zero, but uh, we, we are kind of uh, like uh, much, much better than past models. And uh, we have also done some quantum mechanical verification of the structure that we generated. So, uh, so, this, so first, uh, a minimum thing is that uh, if you generate structure, the quantum mechanical calculator needs to converge. Otherwise, uh, so if, uh, if the structure is not too bad, it will not converge. So therefore, this is the minimum criteria. We found that our model is the only model that can have more than 90% of a like, quantum mechanical convergence rate, while other models are kind of less than 20%. And uh, we have also did some uh, uh, statistic calculation. We generated 3,000 structures. And I think around 30 to 40% of them are kind of a potentially synthesizable, meaning this, uh, this metric called energy value of fall is within 0 0.1 EV. And 95% 95 of, uh, of them are novel, means they have not existed in any existing databases. So we think that this is some uh, promising results to show that our model can really generate a lot of new stable materials that have not been discovered before. And uh, we have also tried this, expo this idea about uh, the direction gen generation material condition on the target property. So the idea is uh, really simple. We have a latent space, right? So we can try to optimize for the target property that we're interested in in the latent space and then decode that to generate the material interesting. In here, what we're doing is that we're trying to kind of minimize the formation energy which is an important uh, property for the stability of the material, trying to minimize that in the latent space, and then we decode the material. Uh, so, so there are like uh, 5,000 optimization steps in the latent space, but we kind of decode the material uh, every 500 steps. And this is the kind of the energy of the material that uh, was decoded, as you can see, during this optimization trajectory. So the energy of the material does go down, even though in some cases it, it does not. And, uh, these are some of the materials that was generated using this conditional generation process. As you can see, it, again, if you're a material scientist, they look quite reasonable, quite, and, uh, and uh, they look quite uh, potentially even synthesizable, and they do have uh, uh, energy that is uh, in the lowest five percentiles in the distribution of the energy, so it, which is an initial demonstration about uh, this idea of a conditional generation of materials. So to make a summary, so in, in here, we have showed some uh, initial progress in the space of generating modeling materials. And the big idea is to take in the existing known materials and uh, to learn a, a parameterizing generating model from which, by sampling from this distribution, we can discover many new materials that we have not known before. And uh, we, can, we can condition on the target properties we're interested in to generate useful materials for a broad range of applications, say batteries, solar cells, et cetera. Uh, and uh, we are continuing working on this progress here at Direction in, at Microsoft, really pushing for this direction to, to solve some, to, in order to some the, solve some of the real world uh, challenge, uh, ch uh, challenges with real world impact. Uh, so what we think a future system could look like with, by, by, by using this uh, generative model to significantly advance the paradigm of material discovery. So we can basically, we are envisioning, we can have a central database that incorporates all the structured materials and their corresponding properties from which we can train a generative model. And then we can couple that with quantum mechanical simulators, which can function both as a way to verify the material structure we generate, but also as a data generator. We can generate additional data. Basically, we can use this generative model to generate new materials that are interesting and then we can use this quantum simulator to simulate them for a very broad range of application. All this data will then be stored back into the central database. And this creates a feedback loop to gradually uh, increase both the size of the data and the quality of the model, such that at the end, this generative model can be really used to solve a broad range of applications that uh, are, are important uh, to our human society today. So that is the end of the major talk, but uh, I'm going to give a quick overview about uh, the institution that I'm currently inside. Uh, so Microsoft Research in AI for Science is a new institution that is established at uh, uh, Microsoft Research. And, uh, and so the idea is really to use AI to solve some of the biggest challenges. And we are a global organization, uh, works very closely across the geographic locations. 
We have uh, offices uh, in, 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 in Cambridge here in the UK, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and Beijing and Shanghai in China. And we, have, we just had a new office in Berlin uh, in, in Germany. And also we work very closely with the, our, office, our, our main offices, uh, so the, the headquarters uh, in the Redmond in Seattle uh, in the US. So our core mission is to uh, our commission is really to use uh, machine learning to advance the science because uh, we uh, Microsoft has strong belief that uh, uh, deep learning is really going to have a transformative impact in natural sciences. It will really increase our mo ability to model and predict the natural phenomena uh, uh, over over a, a, a varying scale of space and time. So what we're trying to do at AI for Science is really to combine experts from many domains, including machine learning, quantum physics, uh, computational chemistry, molecular uh, biology, fluid dynamics, software engineering, and many other disciplines to really work together to solve some of the grand challenges that uh, are pressing in this, in this community. Uh, so we are, we are pursuing a very broad range of topics at AI for Science. Where uh, we we focus on a lot of application areas, including drug discovery, material discovery, catalysis, plasma physics. We're also working on a lot of uh, methodologies: density functional theory, machine learning potentials, enhanced sampling, molecular dynamics, and many machine learning methods, generative modeling, neural PDE solvers, and uh, reinforced learning. I'm sure that uh, these are some topics many of you uh, are also working on. So this is a very small part of our team. Uh, we have uh, really renowned researchers uh, uh, who are leading our, uh, who, who are very, uh, well, have really highly interdisciplinary team with people from machine learning experts in many of those domains, and have very renowned, uh, renowned uh, uh, field uh, machine learning experts like Chris Bishop, our lead, and also Max Walling, who are who are who are very uh, who are one of the uh, who are very uh, influential researchers in the machine learning community. So, so in our team, uh, uh, just the final brief introduction about our team, that in our team, we're really, really trying to rethink material discovery with generative models to solving some of the sustainability challenges where we try to combine machine learning and uh, uh, machine learning innovation combined with uh, a Microsoft, uh, Microsoft scale compute to generate a huge amount of data for a problem and we aim to work with partners to solve some of the biggest challenges in the field. And if at, the end, at the end, we hope to really transform materials design uh, that can have real world impact for some of the sustainability challenges we're facing today. So, and uh, I hope it will be interesting to you. And uh, we're also very welcome to, if you're interested, we have an intern program and also we have positions for researchers and engineers. So if you're interested, uh, you can let me know. And you can also look at our web website by searching for Microsoft Research uh, AI for Science. So that is uh, the end of the talk. So I uh, hope it's useful and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Classical methods are not exact in the way they do approximations. So, so I was quite interested in what your false positive rates end up being, and whether that's what you meant by synthesizable. Yeah, that's a that's a very great point. So, so basically, the field of using computation to guide material discovery is a field that has been established really for many like uh, thirty years since the develop, since the availability of computers. And uh, so at this stage, what I would say is that uh, uh, with classical computers, you can solve some of the problems, not every problem. And uh, the field has been moving quite significantly, especially in the past decade, due to the availability of a large scale classical computers. Uh, so, they ha so I think uh, given the progress that has been shown to be, for example, discovering, experimentally discovering new batteries, new solar cells as a result, of uh, using classical computer as uh, simulators. But uh, it has a lot of limitations, as uh, has mentioned in the past the talk. So, uh, so the way that I'm envisioning it is that uh, in the short term, we're still relying on, on, on classical computers uh, that can run at a very big scale. And we can do innovation in algorithms 
to, to, to basically solving, shorting the equation better with a classical computer. There's a lot of effort in machine learning that can accelerate that as well. Uh, but over the longer term, uh, maybe I would say in five to 10 years, uh, once the quantum computer become much more mature, I think that there's a good opportunity to really couple these two components together, uh, uh, quantum computers as a data generator combined with machine learning to do material discovery. So that is the way that I think about it, but that's just my personal opinion. And, and where is the sort of false positive rate currently? Uh, it's harder to say po false positive rate, right? So it's a, basically what you would do is that you would uh, find a material, let's say I find 10 material, I go to the lab, and I synthesize it, right? So, and usually, uh, you can, it, you, you, this will take half a year to a year. It's really a long time process. But the, the, I would say people can find one or two materials from, say, five candidates. That is the rough kind of a state of uh, uh, the status in the field. Yeah. So, so 60%. Yeah, but, uh, but it's a very, no, very dominant. Of course, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I'm yeah. just getting a handle. Thank you. Good. There's actually a question by Joel from the previous speaker from the previous talk. Joel, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just have a question about what you meant. Oh, sorry, I, like, how do you know? You said you said that the materials that you found were synthesizable. Mm -hmm. How do you know that? What, what's the process that we should find out? Oh, yeah. Synthesized? That's a great question. So I, I, I kind of skipped that part, details, but. Uh, the, the idea is to use, uh, uh, maybe you're familiar with DFT, uh, that, that's the functional theory, to compute uh, the energy of the material, and then you compare the material with all the nearby potential materials, uh, phases in the phase diagram, and then there is an energy, com there's a, you, can, you can compute a metric called energy above the convex hull. Uh, many people, it's been kind of rel relatively well established that if the energy above the hull is zero, it's very likely to be synthesizable if it's within 0 0.1. It has a reasonably good chance to be synthesizable, and that percentage is within 0 0.1 EV per atom. So that is the metric. But uh, you can do much better than this, but this is kind of a reasonably well-established metric that many people use in the community. So you use DFT? Yes, yes. Yeah. No? Okay, so let's thank Tian again. Thank you. Thank you. So we actually have lunch now. Uh, so we have an hour and we have the poster session at the same time and we're coming back at, at what? At uh, three or? At 1.45, sorry, yes, at 1.45.